Welcome to The Freedom Factor. I'm your host, Oliver Bardwell. For this episode of This Week at the Capitol, our special guest is Senator Sandy Salmon, who represents Senate District 29. Senator Salmon has been fighting for our freedoms at the Capitol for over a decade. Thank you, Sandy, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Oliver. It's good to be with you and good to be with your listeners and and I uh, hope to let them know what's going on and, you know, give them some insight about the things that we're de- grappling with there at the Capitol. Well, and you've been on fire this session. It seems like bill after bill is coming out, especially for protecting our children and our parental rights. Yeah, that's that's what I'm focused on this session. And, you know, it just seems like there's, you know, some schools out there that are <clears throat> trampling on parents' rights and um, and teaching uh, things that parents don't want to see, critical race theory type stuff, LGBT stuff, the explicit materials in the schools. And, and you know, those things just should be. And so I'm working to try to put some uh, provisions in our law that will protect parents, give them a pathway to defend themselves, and hopefully um, bring an end to what some school the way some schools are practicing. And you know, I don't see all schools doing this, um, but y- there are some that are. And so my argument is, well, not everybody's stealing either, but we have. L- laws against burglary and and thievery so you know you have to go after those that are trampling on others rights that's the bottom line well and the ones that aren't don't have to worry about it right right this is what government's for right is to protect people's rights that's the basic purpose of government and sometimes i think we get um lost or keep our get our eyes off the ball and well, it we seems like your eyes on the ball. It seems like your eyes are on the ball this session. Um, <laughs> so SF one sixty, I I spoke on behalf of that yesterday. Can you tell us a little bit about that bill? Yeah. So what that what that does is it says that that our health boards are prohibited from restricting the prescribing authority of a doctor during a public health disaster emergency. As that this is what we saw during the COVID pandemic. Um, the mm-hmm. um, boards, Board of Medicine was discouraging, not prohibiting, but just discouraging, you know, just throwing cold water on a doctor's prescribing authority, uh, especially for patients that had COVID-19 and were trying to um, get some medications that would help them. And the, you know, this... <laughs> This just shouldn't be happening. And so um, that's why this law is needed. So, and, you know, in addition, the law, the proposed bill also says that a doctor can't be, um, uh, can't be disciplined for uh, prescribing ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine to, to a patient with COVID-19. Is because this is what's been going on is that some doctors have been harassed, investigated, threatened by letters for uh, prescribing those drugs, um, off-label pre- prescribing, which they're allowed to do for COVID nineteen, and you know this just shouldn't be happening. People, <laughs> you know, I don't know if people lost their lives over it. I, I think there have been some loss of life over it, but certainly. People have suffered more than they needed to have suffered because our healthcare system was being, um, you know, throttled and restricted from doing the things, uh, caring for people, giving them medical care that we've always known and always 
uh, understood to be their right to do. Yeah. So, and that was the Iowa Medical Board, right? That was yes. meeting these doctors. Yes. Yeah. And it was a challenge to get e- either of those drugs. Um, I think I had to go through a compounding pharmacy in Kansas City when I when I needed it. So yeah. that that's a great bill. And that was early in the week. I'm, I was mistaken. Yesterday, it was SF-159. Yes. Uh, SF-159. Yeah, the what you were talking about was SF one sixty, which we had yeah. on Wednesday, and then on Thursday we had SF one fifty nine, which which dealt with the uh, parental rights and education. Basically, it it was Florida's um, uh, parental rights and education law uh, adapted for Iowa for grades K through eight, and basically it. Er, required schools to notify parents if there was a change in their physical, mental, or emotional health uh, or well-being, which um, with 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 some schools, they were not reporting such a major change that uh, was happening with some students presenting themselves in the school as the opposite sex with a different name and um, parents weren't being notified about it. I mean, presenting presenting yourself as a different person is a major, major change in your psychological, your mental, your emotional health. And this is something parents should, they should be aware of it. Schools should be telling um, the parents when this happens. And then furthermore, what, what's happening is what this bill does is it um, requires that schools cannot or that schools cannot discourage a student to withhold information from a parent. So the schools cannot, can't, you know, tell a student, you know, you don't have to tell your parents, you know, encouraging them to withhold that information. So um, because we had schools that were keeping parents in the dark and that just, that just shouldn't be. Parents have the responsibility to to for the care and the upbringing of their child, and so they have to know what's going on with that child. The school isn't in charge of the child; the parent is in charge of the child. And this is where sometimes I think some schools have lost sight of this important, most basic, fundamental right of parents. So yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's designed to deal with that. And what it also does, Oliver, is prohibits LGBT instruction for grades K through eight. And LGBT instruction is, um, it touches on religiously um, informed topics um, for parents beliefs about sexual ethics, sexual morality, sexual practices are all informed by their faith. And and that's true for the Christian faith. And most, many of these families are Christian families. And so with the schools coming in with a different viewpoint on how sexual morality and sexual behavior and ethics ought to be conducted, um, this flies in the face is contrary and opposed to many parents' views on how sexual morality and ethics ought to be shared with their children. And so therefore, it's just better for this these kinds of topics to be left at home um, with the parents and the schools just sh- should not be waiting in to this topic, it's violation of, um, I guess, the separation of church and state. If you want to go down that road, but it's you know that we've always been told don't bring religion into your school. Well, this is um, darn near close to doing that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it's really important for kids to be protected, especially when they're developing their identity and their beliefs and values. I mean, that's something that um, parents, their parents, their church, their family, that should be left up to them. So what's the next step for um, SF-159? Well, um, 
I found out this week that the governor also has a bill dealing with these issues as well. And it's not out yet. It's it's still being drafted. So I was going to go through that and see, you know, how closely it aligns with, you know, the one I put forward and, um, you know, try to get agreement on, on this issue and how it should be handled. So that'll be the next step forward for it. We'll be seeing um, how if we can come to some agreement um, with the with the governor's office on how the how it should read or what the provision should be. Can you explain? So sometimes the Senate will will put forth a bill, and sometimes the House mm-hmm. will put forth a bill that mm-hmm. are similar. Um, right. and sometimes the governor will put fourth legislation so how yes. do you guys figure all that out well it's sometimes tricky i i know uh, senator rosenboom who's the chair of the education committee asked me to go through the governor's bill this weekend and and uh try to figure out where those differences are so um you know that's all about all the process is to you know dig into the bills and figure out you know where the differences are and you know what what's going to be agreed upon. So So. how is SF-159 enforced if schools are found in violation? Uh, Well, there's a path for civil enforcement. Uh, Parents can bring a lawsuit if uh, if that's being violated. And I can't remember all the, all the, um, let's see. I can't. Looks like you've got quite yeah, a. I've got a lot of stuff there. Okay. I, you know, That's I don't okay. remember. There's a civil penalty, I believe, involved there if they're found in violation. So you know, I I I've had several bills like that, and so I think it was something to do with their funding. Yeah, it yeah. has to do with funding. So yeah, so which which puts some teeth in it. Right, and so yeah. What else has happened? What else has happened this week at the Capitol that has been important? Well, we we uh, passed the uh, cap on non-economic damages. This is a little bit complicated, but the tort reform. The tort reform, yeah, that was a big one that passed this week. And what was um, your stance on that? I voted no. Yeah. Um. Because, see, what would happen is in certain cases, and there's not going to be very many of them, but if you have a very egregious case that happens to somebody that does not have income, a non-income earning person, like if it's a child or a, um, say, a retired person or stay-at-home mom, then there would be no economic damages, and then this would cap the economic damages at $1 million. Well, what happens then is that, is that um, at $1 million, the um, these kinds of cases, generally the 90% of the time, the doctors win. So, and, and um, the, um, the only way a plaintiff or somebody that's a victim can afford to bring a case is if they make an agreement with their attorney to um, their that if they win, the attorney gets um, generally it's like forty percent of the of the award. Well, it, um, it costs an attorney to bring a case to trial like this, a a severe medical malpractice case to trial, it costs them between $250,000 and $500,000. So you're talking about asking an attorney to bring forward an extremely expensive case to trial that maybe takes two or three years to do, and they might only have a 10% chance of winning. You're not going to find an attorney willing to take up that case and spend the time and money on it when you know, there's a high likelihood that they will lose. So basically, for practical purposes, what it does is it denies the Seventh Amendment right to trial by jury 
in those most egregious cases where the victim does not have any um, economic damages. I have an example here. So I'm sorry. That's just, I know it's complicated, but. Well, I have an example here right in front of me, and it was a Marvin Morris case, drowning by intubation at Unity Point. So yeah. from this amount, the clients would receive the following from this settlement. Total recoverable amount, a million dollars, less attorney fee for three and a half years, 40% approved by the court, $400,000. Less out-of-pocket expense for settlement, $222,037. Less out-of-pocket expense to take case to trial, one hundred thousand. The total they would have received would have only been two seventy-seven nine sixty-three divided by four claims was sixty-nine thousand four hundred ninety dollars each for the death. Yeah. So that I mean, that doesn't that, seem like a very no, yeah. no uh uh-uh. so we're 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 trampling on that. Seventh Amendment right. So for practical purposes, you're not going to get an attorney to take up that case. So, you know, the the what's going to happen is that those victims are not going to go away. What will happen is that the uh, cost will be shifted over to the state because, you know, the state will be the one that will have to, you know, pick up whatever is necessary there. Okay. And, and so then that opens the door. Now we're going to have the trucker tort reform bill coming through, right? Yeah. So, you know, accountability, having accountability is really important, you know, in in any profession. And, you know, um, the medical profession is no different. I mean, there should be accountability there, just like there is in any other profession where, you know, if you make a an, an egregious mistake with gross negligence, you should be liable. There should be accountability. It helps to improve performance. You know, I mean, that's why we passed the governor's school choice bill, because having more choices will help everybody's performance. Well, so now in this, we've taken away some measure of accountability in certain cases. And I don't think it's very good. Now we're going to look at t- taking it. Uh, accountability away from uh, the trucking industry, you know, and when is that bill coming forth? I don't know. I heard it maybe next week. So what can, so so golly, should we do, what about construction workers or, you know, uh, what about nurses or, (laughs) you know, where, where does it stop? I mean. So what is your advice to people who are against this to your constituents and to other, you know, Iowans? Well, they need to contact their legislators. And we had some legis. I I think because no one ran on that issue, you know, I don't think that the public knows that much about it or under understands that much about it you know when they hear the word tort reform they don't know what tort means it tort refers to um a civil a civil violation or i probably i'm not an attorney probably can't explain it that well but as as opposed to a criminal action it's when you bring a civil lawsuit for damages that have been done to you um in a contract case, for example, or just like in this medical malpractice, just um, breaching a standard of care. Um, I I wish I had an exact definition for you. That's okay. No, thank you. You know, and so I'm kind of, you know, going down a rabbit hole, but the public just needs to learn more about it. And, um, you know, I don't think it's well understood the potential. If you never have anything egregious happen to you, you won't even be affected by this law. You yeah. know, so but for those that do, you, you don't know who it's going to be. You know, it could be you tomorrow. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, if one person's rights are trampled on, you know, really, it's all of our rights that are trampled on. So that's why it's important to protect constitutional rights for everyone. Well, thank you for your vote on that and for always standing for freedom for us. On 
So what's um, what's up next? Or SF fifty? I see you've got a bill for relating to the requirements for filters on mobile devices. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah. That one. Um, that one. What it does is it requires a, the manufacturers to install uh, digital content blocking capability or internet filters against pornography on all devices that are capable of accessing the internet and that these filters be turned on when they're activated so that the default position when a parent buys a, a cell phone, the, the pornography filtering software will be automatically turned on. So it, it, the default position would be in protection of kids. So right now, they're they are the software is turned off, which means the default position is is uh, access for predators. Right. <laughs> and right. why should that be? You know, we we should be protecting kids and families, not be you know allowing access for predators. And the Supreme Court has already ruled in many different cases through the decades that. Um, this is something that uh, they encouraged to be done and uh, said in their opinions that that uh, could and should be done. So so do you do you have a lot of support for that? I, I, I think there's a lot of people that support it, but they are not necessarily aware of it. And it's been assigned to a subcommittee for about two weeks now. And um the subcommittee chair is to Senator Kelker. She hasn't scheduled a meeting for it yet. So um, I don't know if she, you know, after this much time, I can say, I don't know that she's inclined to schedule a subcommittee meeting for that. And, you know, so if people wanted to write her and encourage her to do that, that would be great. I think that's a common sense bill. I mean, it seems like I heard the average age kids are exploring exposed to porn on their phone now is like 11 or yeah. something crazy like that. Yeah. What's her name? And also the, the like 92% of, of uh, males by the time they reach college age have been exposed to pornography. Wow. I mean, that's almost total saturation of our, of our men. So basically the bill would just require that it's turned off. When yeah, they, they require the digital, the filtering the software to be turned on. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, so basically you're helping good parents be good parents. Right. It's, it's not going to get rid of everything, but it does give a tool to help parents instead of making it. Who is the harder. chair? Who is the chair for that? Senator Kalker, Carrie Kalker. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I would encourage folks to contact her and okay. uh, bring that bill forward. SF50, bring that forward to subcommittee. Yeah. Okay, I, I got yeah. that. Um, what else um, are you working on that I saw that you had? Oh, shoot. Um, the disaster bill. What was that one? Oh, yeah, the pu public health disaster emergency. Yeah, that, um, that bill... Uh, what it would do would be to say that a governor's disaster proclamation, you know, in the, in the event of a public health disaster or any disaster would be in effect for 30 days and would only be able to be extended by the legislature or 60 days. I'm sorry. And would only be able to be extended by the legislature for 60 day increments. What is that bill number? Do you remember? Oh, Senate file 91. Yeah. So and and it also since our you know current law, see what I felt was uh, what I felt was that you know in our current law the governor has the sole burden of governing during a disaster emergency, and there's no reason that she should have all that burden herself. The governor should not have all that burden herself. The legislature should share in the burden of governing, and so this is an attempt to change the law to put that in place. Also, the law is silent on protection of rights during a disaster emergency. And, you know, we saw how in many states, um, you know, people's rights were not protected. And we, we don't know what, what kind of governor we're going to have in 10 or 15 years. 
So this also spells out that um, that that you can't infringe on a constitutionally protected right. You can't restrict rights when it's unevenly applied, like some businesses can stay open and others have to be closed. And you can't prohibit a doctor or or I mean a pastor or or the family from visiting a, a you know a loved one in a nursing home or in a hospital. Um, you know it prohibits tracking or surveilling with technology. Um, it also um, um, it also reiterates some of what was in the drug prescribing bill. You know that you can't restrict a um, a doctor's prescribing authority. That's in there too. And uh, you can't require diagnostic tests, vaccinations, quarantine, or treatment of healthy people. This sounds pretty uh, important. Yeah. Yeah. So what what is the next step for SF91? Well, right now, I, I'm sorry, the phone's ringing in the background. That's okay. <laughs> but um, the um, chair has the bill now, which is Senator Jason Schultz. And so people should contact him to move that forward um, and continue to encourage him to do that. He is trying working with the governor's office to see if she would be open to looking at some of these changes. So um, there's where okay. <laughs> prayers are needed. <laughs> okay. We you will know. be, uh, we'll shoot Senator Schultz some emails and let him know that we want yeah. him to move that forward for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So is there this next week, what are you looking at at the Capitol? Are there some some big, uh, big rocks or big, important things coming up? Well, like we talked about before, the trucker tort reform bill coming up, which I'm not in favor of that. And also, I'm hoping that we can file the bill dealing with um, sexually explicit materials or pornographic materials in our schools um this um this bill has been worked on we're trying to make it so that it uh that the legislature will take it up and so that attorneys will be um incentivized to take up these cases uh with if a parent brings a lawsuit for having pornographic material in the school and so basically it just it prohibits a school administrator or a teacher from knowingly providing or requiring to read or view obscene material or hardcore pornography. And will there be involved there too, a loss of teacher's license or administrator's license as well. So what, uh, what's the file number we, for that? We haven't, we haven't filed it yet. We're getting co-sponsors. I just gave you a sneak peek as to, you oh, know, okay. Bill is going to contain, um, um, so no. it's not particularly difficult. But you know, when you talk about trying to write bills so that <clears throat> you can nail down an issue like pornography, it's not easy. And so well, we and have a lot of attorneys have input on this to help us, you know, get it so where attorneys would take it up. Does it cover the obscenity as well, like? Um... When you say pornography, is it just artwork and visual images, or is it the graphic depiction or description? Yeah, all like of in the some above. of these books. Yeah, because some of these books, like that book Push, just graphic. There's a lot, a lot of the books, graphic, graphic description of, yeah, you know, um, pedophilia, uh, incest, all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah, this was these are the kinds of things that used to be, um, you know, only offered in triple X rated bookstores years ago. Right. I mean, there's no no redeeming value to them at all. In fact, it this kind of thing really damages kids. It damages families. It's a worse. It can it can um, it can sp uh, spawn addiction. Uh, because it's known now scientifically that uh, pornography actually rewires the brain and the, how it works to uh, make it a very addictive 
uh, type of uh, viewing or or um, exposure to have to overcome. Well, um, it's definitely something that shouldn't be in our schools. Kate. Yeah, it well, shouldn't be. I, I mean, if we're going to have that in our schools, well, we just as well, you know, offer beer and wine at lunchtime or have tobacco available in vending machines. We just as well do that. Because, right. the, well, the advantage of tobacco and alcohol is that you can actually get that substance out of of where you're at so that you don't partake in it. But the disadvantage of pornography is that you can't ever unsee an image that you've seen. Right. So, you know, you it, it'll, it would dog you all the time. And I think there's a lot of people that can attest to it. And a lot of people have struggled with that. And. You know, there is no reason we it is absolutely evil and wicked and predatory to be introducing kids to this kind of material. Yeah. It should never happen, let alone in a school. Schools has a special, tr- you know, special responsibility, a special trust has been placed um, on on those um, uh, teachers and administrators. You know, you know and they, parents they, expect they're going to the kids are going to be protected when they go to school. They they want to be a trusted organization, yet they're asking for uh, to be able to keep secrets from parents, to be able to introduce these books to kids. Um, yeah. It's it's pretty sad that we have to legislate common sense and decency. Um, now, did that have something to do with the oversight committee hearing meeting last week? This bill that's coming out. Um, this bill has been worked. I started working on it in the fall. Right. I've been working on it for several months. Um, I was thankful to have that government oversight committee hearing because it brought the issue to the fore again. Right. You know, but I tell you, I can't believe the people that are actually take their position is actually defending pornography in the schools. I mean, how can you, that's an indefensible position. I don't even know how they can take that position. They put some vagary on it. They turn a blind eye to the actual content. And then they try to, you know, say, oh, it's against the LGBT community or something, or it's against, or it's racist, or they, they put some weird, um, you know, some social concept on it that it's supposedly against and it's book banning when they're not actually looking at the pornographic content. Well, I I would say we need, if we have LGBT students, they should be protected from porn too. There should be equal protection for, for (laughs) LGBT students or heterosexual students or whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter what, what uh, their preference is. They should all be protected. Yeah. Okay. So we'll look for that for sure. That's one yeah. we we'll support and get past. Is there anything else next week that you think is important for us? I think there's a oh, subcommittee. What else? What else? Um, at twelve thirty on Monday for HF eight. That's okay. Which house. one is that? HF eight. Let me look it up real quick. HF eight above. For an act prohibiting instruction instruction related to gender identity. Yeah. So it's yeah. similar. It's it's a small piece of what I think is in SF one fifty nine. Yes, it it's kind of a, a narrow, narrowly scoped bill. Yeah. Yeah. So well, you know, I I, I say, you know, the more of these bills, the merrier. I mean, right. it all right. serves to push the momentum toward putting something in place that will protect these kids. And so that's, you know, that's my hope with it all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate your time today on your day off, your one day off that I know you're working on your, your uh, event for tomorrow and, and get yeah. work done. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, how can, how can people find you? I know you have a fantastic newsletter. I read that. Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm I'm on your mailing list. How can other people get on your mailing list? How can they find you? Well, go to sandysalmon.org and you can sign up right on the homepage for my newsletter. Well, that's pretty easy. So (laughs) 
<laughs> everybody do that. Go to sandysalmon.org and sign up for her newsletter. She she gives kind of an overview of what happened last week. She sends that out to all her constituents. Yeah. And it's a good way to kind of keep keep up on what's going on at the Capitol. Well, Sandy, yeah. thank you so much for always uh, for standing for our freedom. Well, thank you, I see you, you at the Capitol. I know you're working on it. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're working, pushing them pushing the issue forward as hard as we can. So For sure. And everyone else, thanks for joining us. I hope that this was informative for you and inspires you to get involved. So we'll keep sending out updates and calls to action. And remember our state motto, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. So yes. have a blessed day. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>